Good. So today we are speaking about designing for diversity. That is, I shouldn't move. That is um, something that we never actually cover during the course. Is, is still something important to consider and also something for you to consider while you developing you are developing your in this stage high fidelity prototype something to keep in mind for for you um, and so it's not a series of technique it's not a methodology it's not something really fun that you can apply or should apply tomorrow it's not part of an assignment etc it's something that is important to keep in mind in general in this course but also in the future and something we could have also spoken about like in week one of the course so not necessarily here is like an addendum that fits well in, in many moments in the course so let's start for what we should know at to this moment that's like after a lot of time um, so we should know and I hope you know that it's important to design, to create things for people, not just for us, to clear our assumption, to just put our assumption to the door and consider the actual needs and the actual benefits that, so framing a problem according to the needs before solving a problem. Otherwise we risk to solve a problem that actually is not really a problem. So that is one thing that we know and we have seen up to now the vast majority of a human-centered process that is starting from the human getting evaluation in the form of the heuristic evaluation in your sense in your case from people that are the expert and we will see in January after the break um, how to do usability evaluation with your immediate user that you identified and that's something you now should know, right? Yes? No? Hello? You are five here at least, try to be more, and you choose this way, so yes, it is something you, you share, right? Yes. And the other things we should know that people are a mess, that's not really a, a precise and technical definition, but gives the idea, uh, because people you have experienced partially, you experience, I think, every day, if you think about it, that people are a mess, uh, are complicated, they have different abilities, they have different weaknesses, they have a good day, they have a bad day, they have various background, they came from different cultures, languages, interest, viewpoint, and etc., etc., etc. They have different ages, different sizes, different culture, um, different things that they know and and when we we approach people for whatever reason we often don't think about all these factors but we we can if we want to think that the others are different from me in many in many way hmm? from us in many way but all these things that we said about messiness of people and also about the needs and about, also about problem framing, etc., are all things that impact the way in which an individual or a group of people use a software application and ultimately if they can use it or not. Mm? So let's think about a simple example. Um, if you do a software in English and then you do it to your grand-grandmother that doesn't speak English can or read English can this person use that piece of software? No. So again, not rocket science, but that is a small, let's say, a requirement, a small feature that should also again think about the human-centered process. So who is your target user, your immediate population? So. These things from small to big things are impacting how people can use them. So this is something we should know, so nothing new. Something we typically don't, we didn't explicitly 
uh, appro um, approach it was this question. Are we designing, did we design and create or start to create something, an application, a software, whatever, for people like us or not? And not physical, not necessarily identical to us, like a twin, but thinking about are we using our ability as a starting point, as an assumption, as yet another assumption for designing an application or for designing a software or not? What do you say? in your design, in your project? Are you assuming that people have the same set of abilities, mental, physical, motor abilities, than you have? No. Why not? It's impressive if it's not for real. We can skip this lecture then, because you already know everything. Why not? Yeah, it's for people, I'm saying not your twin or you, but did you use your own abilities as a starting point for the design? Or which other things you considered in the design of your application? Did you consider, well, we here in this room have normal or with correction sites, for instance. So we see more or less normally, typically, right? Any one of you is colorblind? No, apparently not. So we also perceive colors as the majority of the world. And did you consider that this is not true for everybody in your design of application? You did, okay. The others? Yeah, but the interviews is depend who you are were interviewing. So if it's like people going to the gym, then maybe you don't have a, a large. But this is something you can learn from that phase. Absolutely, yes. But typically, so up to now, if you reflect on your project, we didn't force you. We didn't tell you to consider any of these other aspects. He did. Good for him. But typically, uh, maybe also people not here, um, we are used to start from our own abilities. We can use a keyboard, a mouse, a touch screen. We can see in this room typically well with some eye glasses maybe. And we have typical developed uh, ability and mental capability, so cognitive efforts, etc. And And this is something we could have learned from the need finding phase if we included that people that different kind of people uh, within our target population. Um, but our approach, our instinctive approach is to, and also yours initial approach was to design like people like you. How many projects in this course started, oh, I want to do something for students? Because it's easier to reach out students because you are students also. So it's easier to approach that specific uh, population than not other way more complicated under many, many perspectives, not only convenience, but also for what they would, would need. Um, so if we design for people like us, that is our, let's say, first reaction, is the consequence is that we end up with systems designed for people like us. Because we design for people like us, other people like us design for people like them, and so systems are typically uh, designed for typical, whatever it means, population hmm? within a specific age range, within a specific culture, but maybe still uh, like people like us. So we tend to um, design for a specific gender, for a specific age range, uh, with specific language ability within maybe the target population we we're imagining with a specific target, tech literacy, physical ability, specific access to money, time, etc. Did any of you consider in doing your prototype that maybe internet connection is not available? No, because typically 
it is here. And so we, again, we didn't, is not condemning you, is we didn't force you, we didn't bring this up first, and it's, it's fine, but just to think that after this course, after maybe the university, in creating things, also it's a good idea to keep in mind that not all is important a human-centered process, not all is important to pick uh, a target population, but also in that target population, also in the things we are doing or we are modifying, because maybe we are modifying something that is existent, there are people that are not like us under many, many perspectives, like this one. Um, what do you do in your project that is not for people like you? They didn't add, actually do, okay. Um, so let's start from some definition. So we typically, I didn't say on purpose um, that we see, let's say normally, but we have a typically developed sense of view, of sight. Uh, because who is normal is actually very, very uh, debatable. Um, but our relationship with technology, our user to technology, our design of technology, heavily depends on what we can understand, remember, see, hear, say, and touch, which are the senses plus the cognitive capability of a person. And we, again, typically made the assumption that all these senses are available. Your project Many of the systems are visual and you can click, touch. If it's on a touch screen, you can hear sound, you can understand what is written, you can remember the information from one point to the other, etc. And we have seen some guidelines, some practice, some theory to say, okay, people don't remember more or less than three plus, etc., minus plus minus items, etc. But these are again typically. Hmm? Um, and we, again, assume typically, again, that all the senses and abilities are fully enabled all the time. And we do the assumption, in practice, we are excluding several people. We are ignoring several people. Um, and when I say I am, we are excluding several people, what do you think about who we are excluding, which, let's say, kind of people we are excluding, which category, if it's not nice, uh, are excluding. Let's make some example. Who your prototype is excluding? People. people who are blind, then? Don't look at a picture. Another example. Unable to use a touch screen, let's put in a more specific way. That's the general definition. For instance, who is unable to use a touch screen? A person doesn't have an arm. A person doesn't have an arm. And exactly. So when I say we are ignoring or excluding several people, you're just fo you, typically again, uh, we focus on these column, not this table. The permanent incapability to use a specific sense. So we are blind. No use of C, of the sight. Or I don't have an arm, because of whatever reason, so permanent uh, situation. But actually, it's also reflecting, as I say here, how people really are as life happens, because things happen. So, yes, one person can lose an arm, but very more frequently, a person can broke an arm. So for a temporary, for a specific moment of time, it's not able to use one arm. So when you assume, or we assume, that people can use both hands to keep a phone and use a touch screen, we are not only excluding those who have a permanent um, disability, but also those who have a temporary environment, like breaking an arm. Hmm? And same things for sight. 
it's a blind people, but there's also people with cataract. So it's a temporary because you can do an operation in most of the case and you can restore your sort of normal level of sighting. So it's a temporal. So don't think, I, I know that when, when you talk about this, the attention goes, oh, accessibility or people with disability or that kind of topic that is clearly included, is not, not included, but focusing only there, one lose the sight on the temporary things that may happen. One can broke an arm by playing some game. One can, at a certain age, often can develop cataract. Uh, one can stop hearing correctly because there is an ear infection or one can have difficulty in speaking because of a laryngitis and then you get some medicine and you, after a while, you start speaking again. So it's a temporary situation. So not just the extreme cases, but also things that may happen because they happen, right? And then there are also, it's more interesting, uh, the temporary that are still things you, you don't really want to, to happen, like you, nobody wants to have a laryngitis. Like, oh, cool, I have an arm injury now. Nobody wants really to be in this situation. It happens less frequently than, uh, more frequently than the permanent case, but still, it, it's, not something, it's not something really positive. And then there is another dimension that is the situational uh, impossibility to use one of these, in this case, one of these action, one of these senses, like touch, seen, hear, and speak. That is, I cannot use both arm if I am holding a baby. If I am a new parent holding a baby, I cannot use because I, my baby, on, in my arm, right? So I cannot use both hand. Uh, and then at a certain point, the, the child grow up and I still, it's a situation. In that specific moment, I cannot. And if I'm driving, and you are developing something for the car, you cannot assume, or something that can be used in a car, you cannot assume that the full attention and sight is available because the driver needs to focus on driving, on the street, on the signal, on other cars, etc. So it's sort of a limitation of seeing. Um, hearing. If you develop a conversational agent, vocal agent, like Siri or something like that, you can use it in this room. Yes or not? Yes, today, yes, at least today, yes. Um, you can use it at your home. Why not? You can use it in a bar on a Saturday night with live karaoke. Yes or no? You can use it with success in a very crowded and noisy place. No. So it is again, it's a temporary situational moment in which technology is always the same technology. You bring the, assist, the conversation assistant on your phone with you and here you can use it maybe with some someone that looks at you because it makes noise. You can use it at your home, you can use it on the train, you can use it in many places, but if you go in a very noisy place, it's not possible to use it with success because the environment is creating a situation where technology is not working as expected. So the same technology that you develop and design. So there are situations in which you should plan for something different. And same things for speaking, mm, there is uh, people who have a heavy accent, and so these, again, conversational agent don't fully understand the uh, situation. So, what can we do? Option one, say it happens, who cares? That's not the, the right option. So, if you think about this, that's the right option is wrong. Uh, option two, um, we accept that in some cases technology is not working well and again th that's it option three we try to find a plan b for those specific cases to at least enable something which that of the three option is the right one a b c 
I already said that A is wrong, so C. Okay, and which is this plan B? So let's, let's put ourselves in the hearing situation or the speaking situation. Let's say that we are in a bar. Say the night, karaoke or whatever, lot of noises, and we have a piece of technology that is on the table, that's vocal, to pick or to get orders, to actually get food for the table. That is a central point in a place where is eating. So if it's Monday afternoon, that's fine, nobody's there. But if it's again very crowded, very noisy, that thing is not working vocally, so we cannot hear, these things cannot really understand the speaking. What can we do to solve this problem? Add, add a keyboard that's useful for input. So instead of speaking, you type. So you add something and add it up. And then for hearing the answer? You write and then to, to get the, the output? display something, you put a display. So you put, let's say, a tablet, a touch screen that is uh, both a keyboard, etc. Okay, let's make it complex, but I cannot use the touch screen. Hmm? No, because we are still in the same bar with crowd, etc. We didn't move from there. You, you listen, no? There is music here, okay. Um, It's complicated. We, we don't need, need to, to bring this example since the end and covering everything, but it's complicated. So the, we typically have one main way of interacting that in this case could have been the vocal one and the speaking one, the speaker, and then we, in some cases, should be able to switch to enable a secondary option that could be the, the touch screen with the keyboard. And maybe if needed, we should make things in a way that this touch screen and this keyboard maybe is large enough to be used with one end, for instance, uh, instead of maybe small keyboards. And that is more in the visual design of the application per se. So we, we should think about these other situational, temporal, permanent context where these things may happen and be ready uh, to do that. So, this is just in general. Let's speak about two specific principle and methodology that enable to, to try to solve this problem. One is the inclusive design, and the other one is what's called the universal design, hmm? that both are related to what we, we said. So, inclusive design, um, it's a design methodology. So it's a methodology. You design an application as you did, and then you can apply at every stage, or almost every stage, this methodology to think about that same picture or any variation of that same picture we had in the previous slide. Hmm? So a methodology that enables and draw the full range of human diversity, uh, including a learning from people with a range of perspectives. So just not physical, like in, the in, in that slide, uh, capability, but it could also be mental capability. It could also be cognitive capability. It could also be visual capability. There, the word example, I'm blind, or I can have a cataract, or I don't remember which was the situational, but you can have also various degree. Maybe I'm not seeing colors, or I'm not seeing some colors. And so how the interface can adapt to my specific needs when I need that. Maybe there will be an option, maybe there will be something else I can do to still be able to use fully um, the main features of the application. So inclusive design is an approach that is called one size fits one and not a one size fits all. Instead, the universal design will be a one size fits all. So in the idea of inclusive design, you want to design a system or a portion of a system or an application or a portion of application, some features for a specific use case and then extending the specific use case to others. That is one size fits all. I pick one thing, I extend it to a little bit so that that little bit can be useful for someone specifically, but also for many other people. And 
another thing about the inclusive design that doesn't happen with the universal design is that th there is no standard and shared definition. There are many definitions of universal design, in inclusive design. There are many principles and practices about it. Uh, I've chosen to use the uh, a, rec a recent definition and practice by Microsoft Design um, that is also available on that side, that link, because I, I think it's, it's get to the point and also very concrete as an example. It's not much complicated. But keep in mind that this is one of the main definitions of inclusive design. And inclusive design has three principles that are these three. The first one is say that you should recognize exclusion. Once you have something, your prototype, you should recognize, you should ask yourself who are, who am I excluding? The first thing is to recognize that you may potentially exclude someone. And identify one of this someone that you are excluding. So you examine what's written there. You examine what you're building, recognize who would be excluding from using it. Um, and say sometimes exclusion happens when we don't pay attention to our biases, to our assumptions, so back to months ago, and it could be also temporary or situational as in the example before. The second principle is that you have to learn from diversity. So again, put people at the center of the design process from day zero. Nothing new at this stage of the course. And then try to imagine how a person with a given set of ability would use that system. And when possible, when not possible, we can try to to bring the system to speak with the person, etc., etc. Uh, even if we cannot imagine the various contexts of that person, because we made an example with senses, but that could be cultural, that could be situational, that could be emotional, that could be many things um, that still bring um, not a good experience with the. Um, user interface. So recognize exclusion, learn something so that next time you don't have to start the process again, but just apply what you learn. And then as a third point, solve for one and extend for many. So solve for one specific person, category, kind, set of abilities, etc., and then extend to many and if necessary, iterate among uh, across these three principles. Um, one small example about uh, various contexts could be, imagine you are designing what you are designing. What you are designing, no, what you are designing? A mobile app for... Uh, Good. For students doing what? Uh, they, to, to speed up their uh, shopping. Imagine you are designing a mobile app for students for speed up their shopping. Shopping of clothes or shopping of what? Of, uh, groceries. Grocery shopping. So you are designing this application. Let's say that you imagine all the physical abilities and also all the cognitive abilities to be ready. Um, do you think, in general, that this same application will be used in the same way if I am at home, alone, thinking what we have to, to buy, or in uh, the same crowded bar of before with karaoke, etc., or under the rain without an umbrella. Do you think that the same, it's the application the same? Do you think that the usage and my experience in using the application will be the same in these three cases or not? Yeah, under the rain would be difficult, but not because you have a physical issues in that moment, but because it was raining, you don't have an umbrella, so, but you, you want to use it, so you will be distracted, annoyed, etc., etc., etc. And when you, when we, but also you, design your application, you always design it, oh, let's put here on a table, let's draw this nice thing, and then now it's program, and we see on our computer, and we discuss together. We don't put this usage in the context of the daily life and see what happens. Because again, the same application that works perfectly while I'm sitting here with calm at home, thinking, oh, I need to buy this or I need to buy that, is significantly different as an experience if I need to do the same thing 
uh, under the rain or in the um, supermarket with 10 minutes left because then the supermarket closed. So the pressure that is not within the application but is in the context is changing significantly. So inclusive design also think about, let's think about these situations, this context. What happens if, what if I'm using the application under the rain? Is the application supporting me in getting the job done or not really? Because I imagine that using with calm at home, for instance. And this is not just about his, their application, just using that as an example, because a mobile application uh, work well in this case, you cannot imagine a desktop web application under the rain. R really, a mobile application serves well that, that needs. Um, so, this is in general. Let's think a little bit about the beauty constraint uh, focusing on permanizability. So, let's put ourselves in the extreme case that is permal dis um, inability or disability instead of a situational temporary. So designing for people with permanent disability is and can seem, a, as I said, significant constraint because you really cannot do some kind of things with your application. Um, but more often than others time, the resulting design, the resulting system, the resulting feature can benefit a much larger number of people. So let's pick this person there as an example, so a person that is hard of hearing. Can you think at least one application, feature, thing that exists that started to solve a specific problem of people who were uh, hard of hearing but then can be beneficial for everybody or for many more people? Captions. Captions started for people who cannot hear what's happening, but then if you are in a crowded place, if you want to watch a video now and want me to listen that you are watching a video, you can turn off the volume and use subtitle and still understand what's going on. So this is one example. Cloud captioning was exactly created for the hearing community, but now they're used for many, and also used for reading, let's say, in a, in a, but also for teaching someone how to read, how to learn a new language. You are listening, how a language uh, sentence is, is pronounced, and then you can also read how the sentence is written. But this was a, something created not for the general population, for created exactly to solve a specific need, and then, everybody else could have access to it and benefit from it. But without thinking to the constraint of that specific population that has strong constraint, we probably couldn't have captioning now. Uh, same things for remote control, automatic door open, audiobook, are all things that started thinking about specific constraint. So why the remote control? the TV control, which was the constraint that... So television, at the beginning, didn't have a remote control at all. What do you have to do to, to turn on a TV without the remote control? You have to wait to stand up from whatever you're seated and go to the television and more than press a button, rotate a knob, and then regular the volume and then go back and then if you want to change program when there were more than one you need to stand up and do the same thing every time uh, but then clearly if you cannot move if you cannot walk you you cannot operate the tv and so remote control but happens that remote control is also useful for not waking not standing and going there so you can control appliances and the television from the distance so it's also comfort aspects now. So sometimes thinking about the hard constraint could be useful because it can be a significant impact for many more people. So let's make an example about inclusive design. Um, let's make the example. So you are promoted as a video game developer, congratulations, for console. So we are creating a video game for console. 
So not for computers, just for PlayStation, Xbox, whatever. And this game has this characteristic. It's a competitive game, so one should win. Uh, and the characters in the game need to jump, run, maybe even drive. So it's not a chess tournament that is competitive, but it's like an action game where there is people that need to run, walk, jump, mm, drive, etc. Mm. So we created this amazing video game with 3D graphics, etc. It's competitive and peop, uh, characters in the video game need to do these action things drive again jump run etc and it's competitive so you cannot you don't want to slow down things because otherwise the person that don't need the extra um, features will win because it's competitive so who are we excluding in creating a competitive visual action-based video game for console, so not computers. Yes, but that the tonic people, but that could be easily fixed, right? It's just maybe they don't see they see a don't know a tree as blue, but still more or less it's a game, so maybe they still understand it's a game that's a, um, a tree and typically video games maybe have two cars and cars number one and number two, so there is a number. So yes, it could be but easy to fix. Who else? It's an action game, uh, there are a lot of actions uh, to be performed, so you need to uh, have, uh, so we are excluding uh, who doesn't have, uh, doesn't have an arm, who has an arm, uh, so who, who can't use uh, both arms to... You say you are excluding people with physical impairments, so they cannot use the the joypad because it's action game so i need to press buttons i need to do things etc um, yes and who else it is typically sometimes connected you're also excluding people who have cognitive impairments severe cognitive impairments because if you have severe cognitive impairments typically you don't develop typically your motor capabilities so maybe the, from a motor physical perspective is everything is 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 medically correct but you don't have enough cognitive uh, capability to actually do the movements so but still it go back down to the um, physical in a sense okay how can we solve this we got the problem we have a game that is competitive and we have uh, children uh, that cannot play the game with me uh, because you cannot press the button quickly enough to, to run. So the charter will always stay, move slowly. Just simplify the, the software so that it's easier to, to do that. But it's easier to do that, right? So it's not as um right i need to still press the button if it, if it took three seconds to press the button still two seconds even if i need to press one button right so it, it's challenging it's clearly challenging but these things could be more or less um and, and this is what we, we we said right jumping driving running etc we require fine motor skills not just motor skill but fine motor skills because you need to press a very small button on a very specific joypad is not pressing a big red button of 10 centimeter right a small button um, and possible factor to consider is surely limited mobility but also what if i never for whatever reason played a video game before i'm totally novice i just never seen a video game for whatever reason so it's, it's also that i will not be proficient like a person that already knows that how what, what is a joypad and that to press X is for doing uh, an option. So it will be more quicker for me to, to, to do. So one possible solution, we, you said a few, one possible solution is, could be a co-pilot mode. So you allow two game controller to work together. 
So two people can control the same character or car or whatever. So in this way, uh, an advanced player, a skilled player, can play alongside someone who might need more support. So if the person, if the character needs to run and then jump, maybe one could be only the one that does jumping and the other one is the one that do running. Hmm? Or switch the co-pilot. So sometimes I am driving, sometimes the other person who is doing things, sometimes half and half. We can decide as the game go along and keeping the competitive nature because we are cooperating within a co co collab co competitive game what to do and this open gaming to various kind of people people with disabilities temporary injuries novice gamers kids we don't want a, a kid to just play alone with this game in this way you can get control when needed and also it opened just the same game, the same competitive game, to people who, was, who just want to play together without competing, because you are collaborating within a competitive game. So one of you is the one maybe more interested in competing, the other one is interested in playing without competing. So this is one possible solution that solved the problem of fine of five control and also open up the possibility of the same modality to uh, other people. This is, this is a solution that is reasonable. Yes. Do you think is actually doable in practice? I mean, c can you, producer of a console, do it? Because this needs to be in the console, right? It cannot be just in a single game. Maybe it can be in a single game, but if it's in the console, it's easier, right? Do you think it's possible to do? How likely you think that Sony or Microsoft could do something like this? Where zero is, one is no likely at all, and ten is extremely likely or done. One, no likely at all? No confidence in Microsoft or Sony or whatever the other are? Actually, the copilot mode exists in the Xbox One. So Microsoft did it. So there is this co-pilot mode that allowed these um, games to, to work in this way. So Microsoft is better than you expected in this sense. So the co-pilot mode exists actually, and it's one thing in the, in the Xbox One. But then this enable, let's say people with motor impairments to play but so this is not an advertisement to the xbox one i don't have it i they don't know even if it's still in commerce the xbox one or they got another xbox anyway um that was a good example of this of this kind of thing um and this open remember the three principles who are we excluding who are we excluding now we said that before I said that before, you have small buttons, you don't have big buttons. What if I cannot press a single button? Because it's too small. So I need time, so jump, but I cannot press. I cannot physically press the button because I, for instance, cannot do this movement with the finger, but just move the head, the hand. So I press all the four buttons. We are excluding a small part of the population, but still we're excluding. So what we can do? Who are we excluding? What we can learn? What we can do? These are the three principles of inclusive design. Define a digital controller, and guess what? They did it. They applied the same inclusive design principle they created for themselves and they did it. This is the Xbox adaptive controller that is complement the normal controller. So here you attach it to the, um, um, to the Xbox, like a normal controller. And by default, you have this button, you have this big buttons here, if you need to press, if you need to something. And if they are not enough, you can plug 
other kind of buttons smaller bigger with less resistance with more resistant impressing etc other kind of devices if needed so it's adaptive means that you can attach things and still they work and they will be mapped on the same button that the xbox has so x a b y so all of these will be mapped on and here there are many others uh, plugs so you can choose what to do so uh, we we can continue if we want with this who are we excluding now probably almost nobody on the uh, physical environments maybe there is other things on the visual aspects on the complexity of the software etc but on that part we are helping and this is again useful for can be useful for for many maybe not specifically this one but this one could be we said that it could be useful for many um, so are we speaking about accessibility not only hmm? so by definition accessibility is an attribute of something um, can be checked and can be fixed um, inclusive design as we said is a method and accessibility focuses primarily on people with disabilities, ensuring that there is no barrier to serving them. Uh, typically via accommodation. So this is all these three things, this thing, one, two, three, are accommodation. Things in this case, hardware accommodation. Um, but that are testable and well-known. Inclusive design instead is a method that makes your product typically more accessible but it's like a byproduct the fact that they're more accessible to specific population and you don't have the guarantee that they match all the accessibility standards that exist and are um, well defined hmm? so in a way they are working together to make the experience that's not only complain complaint with uh, some standards but also usable and joyful in a way playful in the case of the xbox one for many people and this is inclusive design that is one size fits one universal design is instead a one size fit all approach so the idea of universal design so inclusive design try to design things that are good for one and then asking again who are excluding and then ad adding another one Universal design instead is about designing systems that are usable by anyone, by design, in a way, within any range of ability, within any technological platform. It's universal, tend to be universal, not personalized to single one, but for many, for all. One size, one solution fits all the needs, all the people. So less prone to consider very specific use case, while inclusive design start from that specific use case. And it's, it's born from the physical world, and it's still usually applicable to the physical world, is more difficult to apply to the digital one, but still possible to some extent apply to the physical, uh, to the digital world. And universal design has some principle, and you can recognize maybe some of them, like flexibility, all error, tolerance for error, recovering from errors, etc. But you see that many of these principles have a strong relationship with the physical world, like size and space for approach. You can imagine that in the, in the digital world, but clearly on the physical world is easier to imagine that. And here there is an example. What, what is this? You, you have, if you go outside at a certain point, you will find it. Similar to this. What is this? This is a sidewalk, uh, so a ramp within a sidewalk to go up a sidewalk. And you said for people who have wheelchair, and I will tell you not just for them, for whom also? That's a permanent situation or temporary bikes you shouldn't go 
on a sidewalk with bikes, but let's say that you are carrying your bike uh, because you need to stop, or you have, um, again, a children, and so you don't want to do the step, or you have you're the elder, an older person, and you, you cannot do the step, or you are doing grocery shopping and you are moving something, so it's easier to move things uh, on the ramp. Who else? Not just motor capability. That is clearly benefit all. So you can imagine this as an example universal design because benefit all people with motor disability or motor impairments, temporary situation or not. Who else? What are the lines? It's just art or they have a meaning? Blind For blind people. Mm -hmm. So these lines here tell people with a cane that that is a uh, um, sidewalk, they are jumping on a sidewalk, and that the ramp is this, made in this way. Mm -hmm. So it's not straight, but it's um, in a cone, four, in a triangle in a way. And there are lines that tell them with a cane that this is going to, to end at a certain point, right? So it's not, it's not the end of the, uh, of the ramp because there are still lines, horizontal lines in front of you. And when you don't find lines, you are, in theory, on a flat sidewalk. So this is an example of universal design in the physical world because it's useful for motor, it's useful for uh, people who are, let's say, blind or have impairments with the sight so that they can use other instruments to get on the sidewalk safely, in a way. Uh, here there is another example. You, you, I'm not seeing, playing the video now. This is a night tracker. It's a multimodal eye tracker, means that you can use that things with your eyes, looking at a screen only. You don't need to touch anything. So if you have uh, motor impairments, you, you don't need to use any, anything. You just need to use your eyes to control things on a screen. Clearly, you need big buttons. You need something appropriate for, uh, for the control with eyes. Uh, but it's also a touch screen. And it also has audio uh, capability, so it's multimodal because you use multiple modalities to um, to solve the the issue, to solve to to permit to control uh, the things. Mm. So this multimodality is a one way we said at the beginning how we can solve how we can think this plane B for the conversational agent in a bar. We can use multiple senses. We can use rely on multiple senses and multiple abilities as in with that example, and we can provide the redundancy. We can also provide the compatibility with assistive technology so that we don't rely to a speaker only or to voice only, but we have a touch screen, we have a screen, et cetera, et cetera. So if you cannot use the site, you can listen and vice versa. So again, in an inclusive design perspective, it will be not maybe for all, but it will be maybe for many, and it will be useful also for situational uh, moments and situational capabilities. Um, well, these are just examples of accessibility features. Operating system have nowadays accessibility features embedded in them. So on Android, on iOS, on macOS, probably also on Windows, you have some settings somewhere where you can enable multiple accessibility features that will give you also some kind of uh, multimodality. So for instance, um, there is an option for the conversational agent on a smartphone so that you can also type and see, type the message, not just speak, but also you can type what you want to ask, uh, even if it's vocally only. So it's either by default or you can turn it on. So this is a choice to enable multimodality, as we said before, in the example of the noisy and crowded bar. Uh, so multimodality is, again, to use more than one sensory channel or mode of interaction together to fulfill a goal and so the question could be can we use all of that all of them together nowadays for a user interface digital no, no. which one is hard to use taste smell 
the other are easier. Uh, taste would be very, very hard. Um, th there are, if you want, research um, activities about using taste and smell. For instance, smell, uh, they use smell in, um, in a car, and some fancy car already have some perfumes, etc. Very fancy car. Um, but they use smell as a notification indicator that something is wrong while you're driving. So instead of popping up another notification somewhere, since you have a reduced sense of seeing, or in addition to that, they also put some specific perfumes if something is wrong, limited number, and people were able to react, smelling something different, say, okay, this is something wrong, let me pay attention so that they had less trouble while driving. So there were some small cases of that, but it's clearly uh, difficult for smell and taste for how we are using the senses and when they are located, especially smell, especially taste. So we need to put something in, uh, in our mouth. Um, so multimodal interface, just in a nutshell. Um, so our system are typically visual. I think we, we already, I already mentioned this sometimes. Uh, they are often web based. Uh, they use, make use of simple sound when you do some action. Uh, but the main way in which you perceive information through visual to graphical user interface is through vision. Um, and if there is a way it's too complex, the visual channel may be overloaded. So multimodality can also sol solve this overloaded problem for the visual channel that we use. Um, and multiple models, um, multimodality increased bandwidth of interaction. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about enhancing the richness, so adding things for the sake of adding things, but also to provide redundancy. So the same notification, the same error, the same action is uh, shown and played in the same way. So think about when you empty the trash on a desktop computer, what happens? It's a very small example, but it's still an example. What happens? Visually. The paper in the trash disappear. If you have sound on, you hear something? Yes. That is redundancy. So if you look at that, you know that you empty with success the trash. If you don't look at that, because you are distracted with something else, you listen. That, that, that sound that is very, very specific for that operation is done. If you don't hear the sound, you will probably look to see if the operation is complete. So this is about enlarging the bandwidth of interaction. So you are, can focus on other things, still keeping the process, small process in the background and still notice if it's something uh, went on correctly or not, because you are relying on two different senses. One is vision for doing maybe writing a report or programming, and the other one is hearing for getting the information that the trash, small information, is, is empty now. Mm? So this is about redundancy and increasing the bandwidth. Um, so these are two examples of, of, of multimodal interface. One is um, like Siri on a computer that use vision, hearing, and speech, because you can also speak, you, you hear the answer, but you can also see the results. And the other one is, um, I think, uh, an Amazon Echo, in which you also have the touch screen and the screen, the touch screen, so you can also make gestures and, and use that in addition to the other modalities that this device uses. So one small note about accessibility before ending, uh, specifically accessibility for the end, for the web, since we mentioned accessibility. We said that inclusive design is a methodology, accessibility is a set of standard, um, and the starting point is that the web is still largely inaccessible, um, because some sites, for instance, can be still navigated using a mouse, it cannot be navigated in another, another way, so you, if you cannot use a mouse or a touchpad, you cannot navigate the website, for instance. Um, so very few websites are still in the world fully usable for people who are blind, for instance, etc. So it's, it's still uh, something to pay attention, to pay care for, and it's, it's not. Because again, typically um, developer focus on the features or focus on people like them, so don't really think about accessibility, this is something extra 
in some case, perceived something extra to, to do. And um, web accessibility in particular developed a set of guidelines and tools that are standard because it's from the W3C Web Accessibility Initiative that provide guidelines for different levels of web content, so web content like text, image, etc., but also user agent accessibility, so for people who develop a browser, uh, authoring tool, same, and also for rich internet applications, so JavaScript uh, things within an HTML, CSS page that is the uh, area hmm? um, a label that you sometimes may found in some um, framework, let's say Bootstrap, use quite a lot in this example, this ARIA something, and it's about the uh, accessible rich internet application guidelines. And these are also adopted in law, even if the state of accessibility on the web is terrible, there are laws that say you should follow that. There are European laws, and in Italian there is a, a law that is uh, the Stanka hat, uh, from the surname of a person that was, um, that is now, mm, overseed by newer version that actually say that public administration bodies should use, should produce digital content that follow a certain level of web accessibility guidelines and clearly a little of website do it uh, properly. Um, but, but still they are embedded in law. So if one day people would like to really enforce a law that would be uh, a problem for many, many um, public bodies. But this to say, there are guidelines that um, rely on different levels, and these guidelines are guidelines. So there are principles, uh, web content should be perceivable, operable, understandable, etc. Then there are guidelines that rely on that principle, uh, like since the content should be perceivable, you should provide textual alternatives to all non-textual content. And then there are levels of severity of coverage, let's say, of these guidelines. So in that case, the textual alternative is just level A, that is the, the, less, um, the, strong, the less strong as level. Level AA or AAA are more uh, specific and also in some cases hard to reach. Mm? Um, so, what means text alternative? You should know, which is a good approach to provide text alternative to non-textual things on the web. An image. There is the alt tag, the attribute that is meant for describing the alternative text of an image. Uh, and then the level A, because it's really simple, it's, it's an attribute, it's not even time-consuming to do that. Uh, but then there are, let's say, guidelines for time-based media, videos. And there are three levels, level A, level AA, level AAA, and level A should be something like, you should provide captions, things that now many videos do it automatically, in some sort, and then AA, AAA are more restrictive, in, in that, add additional requirements. And then, let's say, operable, keyboard accessible. Hmm? So all the content on the page should be accessible. So you should be able to navigate and operate a website just using the keyboard without touching a mouse. Hmm? Just with the tab and enter. Hmm? They can be mapped on some of those buttons we have seen in the um, uh, Xbox adaptive controller, the big buttons, color it. You two, 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 two buttons you can map on these different devices. So keyboard accessible, open a website of your choice and try to navigate without using the mouse. Try to go to the next page, just without using the mouse, just using the tab uh, button and enter to select. There are websites that do this pretty well and websites that are terrible, you, you can try if you want and it's also easy to, to, to test it, mm -hmm. so etc. There are guidelines, and these are standard guidelines, I was saying, and uh, linked with some law, actual laws. So they uh, can be enforced in a way, if you want, or if you want to be compliant with the law, you should enforce. So this, as you see here, the difference between with inclusive design, inclusive design is about principle. Here is about 
testing that the guidelines in the separate level are fulfilled. And in Chrome, for instance, there is, or you can install uh, an extension uh, to do the automatic detection of these guidelines, because some of these guidelines are easy to check automatically. Like for every image, there is an alt, an alt attribute or not. This is something that can be done automatically. The contrast of the colors in the background and the foreground is something that can be partially do automatically and partially should be inspected manually because you should assure that the contrast between the foreground color and the background color respects some level and in level A is smaller difference than level AAA that basically say something like black and white or that kind of difference, so very strong difference between um, foreground and background colors. And according to the levels, so there is a recommendation to say, okay, level A is fine or level AA is desirable, or in this case, you should really try to do label AAA. But there are levels, so you can choose when there are multiple levels, which one according to the specific case and according to the specific. But all of these is guidelines, is structured, is standard, this is international standard. So everywhere in the world, they can use the WCAG 2.1 or two in this moment, guidelines to, to make digital product, in this case web, accessible. So different from inclusive design because these are a series of instructions and rules, but still uh, as a message, as a, take, as a Christmas takeaway message, don't forget about accessibility, don't forget about um, people who can be in many, many aspects, cultural, situational, contextual, because life happens, etc., different from, from you, you as developer team, as designer team, that you create a, a product. With that, we can close the lect this lecture. Uh, we will have lab tomorrow, a three usual slot, and then after the, the vacation, the next lecture will be after the, the Christmas break and will be about usability testing that instead will be something that you will need for your project um, to, to be done for the exam. If you have any question, as always, I'm still here for 10 minutes. Otherwise, have a good night and see you, some of you, tomorrow.